You're gonna love this one. As the transition to clean energy becomes an increasingly important topic, few people mention the underlying cause on why we're not seeing the desired outcomes that the left keeps promising and failing to deliver. Jordan Peterson and Bjorn Longberg delve deeper into the topic, especially from a political lens, and the conclusion they reach is eye-opening and governments around the world should take this into consideration. But before I give my take on it, watch this. People believe that Trump addressed them if idiosyncratically and eccentrically and even narcissistically, at least directly, honestly, and in an unscripted manner. And Trump was very good at, well, that's the populist danger that the leftists point to, is that Trump could and did to some degree appeal to resentment, and that's very dangerous, especially for a conservative. Um, I think he was also pushed into a corner on that on that front because he was pilloried so badly that it's not surprising that he regarded himself as surrounded by enemies, right? And you can create a monster by persecuting someone intently. And I'm saying that as someone who I think is cognizant and appreciative of whatever Donald Trump's flaws might be. But it's definitely the case that the working class felt that they had been shunted out of the conversation. And the reason they felt that way was because they had been shunted out of the conversation. And it's certainly the case, if that wasn't true in some fundamental sense, hey, you wouldn't have seen the trucker protests in Canada, the corresponding protests in the US, and now the spread of this into Europe, right? You can't just put that at Trump's feet by any stretch of the imagination. Well, in fact, I would argue that their demands are very reasonable, right? Because if you look at the numbers, they have been very successful in reducing uh, uh, emissions over the last couple of years. So we mentioned this before. Really, Dutch agriculture is, is, is astounding. It's, I would argue, it's one of the innovative wonders of the world. And they mostly, right. they mostly complain about the timeline. So again, it's, it's not that they say, no, we want to continue to emit as much as possible. No, they just say that 2030, 2035, and 2050 is not feasible for us. We can't do it in that right. timeline. And the argument that comes back is, well, but, you know, these are these are, you know, EU regulations. Well, that is true. But yeah, whatever. Exactly. And it's something that Bjorn said also before. Well, of course, they have more nitrogen emissions. They are they are the number one agricultural producing country in, in Europe. So so I mean, it's, it's kind of natural that they have more emissions and they did have an exception for a long time. And they pretty much only want that exception to continue. And that's what we're going to sorry. That's what we're going to see this this uh, winter when we run out of, of, of uh, sufficient uh, uh, fossil fuels and some people are going to start freezing, we will be much, much more worried about cold waves than heat waves. But that's not how the media present it. Before I go on with the video, it's a good time to subscribe if you're not, and thanks for watching. If you look at the underlying reasons on why political figures like Donald Trump are popular and resonate well with the public, it's because of how they communicate and their political objectives. One of the key factors behind Trump's appeal is his willingness to address issues that resonate with ordinary Americans but are often overlooked or dismissed by traditional politicians. From immigration and trade to job loss and political correctness, Trump has positioned himself as a voice for those who feel left behind by globalization and the woke left. Additionally, Trump's unfiltered communication style has gained in popularity among people who see him as a refreshing departure from polished and scripted politicians. His blunt rhetoric and willingness to speak his mind, even if it means disregarding political correctness, have struck a chord with those who feel held back by the constraints of polite discourse. His persona is a political outsider who is not beholden to special interests or party elites and has helped his case. Many voters see him as someone who is willing to challenge the establishment and fight for their interests, even if it means facing opposition from powerful forces within the political establishment. Another figure that receives massive support from his populace for addressing their concerns and needs over catering to globalist agendas is none other than Hungary's Viktor Orban. The conservative prime minister has constantly fought back against EU policymakers, putting his country's interests first. For instance, he keeps reminding them to stop fear-mongering people over issues related to climate change or giving aid to others while his country is trying to curb inflation. Is it really the focus on global warming as global warming? Or is it also a little bit the focus on global warming as kind of this ideological struggle that fulfills almost an emotional need for, for many people, much more than an environmental need? There's plenty of other things you could stand up to, and that was what we were talking to. Instead of being the romantic 
romantic hero that stands up against society? Why aren't you the romantic hero that stands up against tuberculosis or the one that stand up against ma maternal death or the one that stands up for free trade or the ones that stand up for all these other things yeah. where we know for very little money, we can make a tremendous benefit. So, so again, any economist would say, you know, look, you have a problem, you emit CO2, but you don't actually take it into consideration because it's free to emit. So that's how we think about uh, the polluter pays. You put a price on carbon. In principle, you should do this across the world. You should do it so that it slowly rises with time. It's the most efficient way to deal with it. There's two things we need to recognize with it. One is it turns out to be very, very hard because it makes it very explicit to people that tackling global warming is actually costly. Secondly, we know that politicians are just really, really bad at doing something for a long time, very consistently across all areas. What politicians typically end up doing is they'll put it on some things. So, you know, in many places in Europe, for instance, you have enormously high taxes on cars and you have enormously low uh, taxes on people who are good at uh, uh, lobbying their governments for their particular interests. So, you know, greenhouse gardeners, uh, uh, greenhouse uh, uh, growers don't have to pay uh, the, uh, the carbon tax because that would make it really hard for them to grow their, you know, tomatoes or whatever. And, and, and you can see how this happens across a wide range of areas. So, that's one part of the problem. The other part is that even if you do this really, really well, it'll only solve a smaller part of the problem. So you should do this. We should focus on, on a carbon tax, but we should also be realistic. This is not what's going to fix climate change. This will fix a smaller part of climate change. So it's part of the solution, but it's not the most important part. That's the million dollar question right there. It is evident by now that climate change has become an ideological struggle rather than purely a scientific and evidence-based issue. The divide has almost led to a system where making reasonable discussions with the left has become increasingly impossible as they take on more extremism positions. This complicated the issue further where there is no discussion on how to adapt to its effects or the trade-offs associated with different policy options leading to partisan rhetoric and sensationalism taking over the public discourse. Take for example the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, CBAM, adopted by the EU last year and that will take full effect in 2026. Under this new law, tariffs will be imposed on some foreign raw material imports that are carbon intensive and don't have a carbon tax imposed on them in the country of origin matching what EU companies already pay in carbon taxes. If you think that law is absurd and will dramatically affect the cost of living, you're correct. According to Paoli Falconi, he is the head of the Appliance Manufacturer Association, Aplia. This law will have many negative effects, noting, and I quote, EU-based home appliance manufacturers will face an increase in the cost of raw materials for the production of one washing machine, ranging between 5 to 10 percent. The high CO2 prices also had a substantial impact on electricity prices, thus jeopardizing the energy competitiveness of European manufacturers. The second part, and that's where I think we actually have the biggest opportunity, is innovation. Uh, so if you talk to uh, Matt Ridley, this is certainly also his, uh, his ballpark, but it's basically recognizing that most things that we've solved in this world are about innovation. So you rarely get people to, to solve a problem by saying, I'm sorry, could you please not do all that cool stuff that you like? Could you please stop feeling good about all of that? That rarely works out as a political strategy. Um, unfortunately, that's typically what we say. Could you please not fly, not eat meat, uh, mm. not do all these things? Could you please have it a little hotter in the summer and a little cooler in the winter? That's really, really hard to sell to most people. What you need is innovation. And, and let me just give you an example. Uh, back in the 1950s, Los Angeles was one of the most polluted places on the planet because there are lots and lots of cars and they have this special sort of geographical notion that just leaves all of the pollution inside this little basin of Los Angeles. It was terrible. Uh, to live there in many ways. Uh, and, and obviously, the simple answer is to tell, tell people, most of this came from cars. So the simple answer would be to say, stop driving your car. Of course, if you've ever met someone from Los Angeles, mm. you know that that's not a solution that's actually viable to them. Well, but there aren't even not any sidewalks. No, it's not you know, really viable for anyone uh, in, in any city. What did solve the problem was the innovation of the catalytic converter. This little thing that cost money, you put on the exhaust pipe, and then basically you have much, much cleaner cars. 
That made it possible for people to keep their cars, drive a lot, and have much, much cleaner air in Los Angeles. Now, I'm not saying everything is perfect in Los Angeles and there's still air pollution problems, but it made it a lot better for very little money. That's the way that we need to solve global warming. If we could innovate the price of green energy down below fossil fuels, and this green energy could be nuclear, it could be fusion energy, it could be solar or wind with batteries, it could be lots of other uh, possible solutions. If we could innovate one or a few of these solutions down below fossil fuels, everyone would switch. You wouldn't need sort of a, a you know, Paris Accord where you have to twist everybody's arm. While everyone recognizes the need to reduce carbon emissions and mitigate climate change, the methods used to achieve these goals are impacting our societies in various ways. For instance, governments worldwide utter the need for moving to renewables, but the upfront cost of transitioning is staggeringly high. On top of that, there's the issue of efficiency and reliability. Since they don't always provide consistent energy output, especially in regions with variable weather patterns, relying solely on renewables without adequate backup systems or energy storage solutions could lead to disruptions in power supply and compromise the reliability of energy grids, affecting consumers and businesses alike. That's exactly what's happened with Germany and their energy transition process, where significant investments were made in renewable energy sources, such as wind and solar power, to reduce the reliance on fossil fuels and nuclear energy. However, the rapid expansion of renewables has led to grid instability and increased electricity costs for consumers. To address these challenges, Germany has implemented measures such as investing in energy storage technologies and grid infrastructure upgrades, which came with their own costs and technological complexities. Actions like these contribute to lower public trust in the ability of the politician to deliver on their election promise. That's what a recent survey conducted by Rheingold Institute found, and I quote, three quarters, 73% agreed our politicians have no idea what they're doing, with only 34% saying they trust the government and its policies. Let me ask you about that for a minute. So it's not a straightforward matter to set up governmental policy to, 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 uh, to support innovation. I mean, innovation is a very abstract idea. And I've seen much evidence of failure at the governmental level here in Canada when, when governments have set out to um, foster entrepreneurship and to seed you know, the development of high-tech industry, for example, it, generally it's a cataclysmic failure. I mean, obviously it's self-evident in some sense that a good idea is good because it solves a complicated problem and the more good ideas we have, the better. But do you think that it's like, it seems on the face of it, unless you dig down into the details, it seems like hand-waving. Obviously we should have better ideas to solve our problems, but you, what do you think constitute concrete, realistic, evidence-based solutions to the problem of fostering innovation? Do you think it's actually possible to set up policy that does that? Yes. So the short answer is yes. And, and, and the reason is that what, what, what's lacking is mostly long-term investment. So investment that will only generate the solutions in 20, 30, 40 years. Remember, uh, this is why we invest a lot of money in healthcare of uh, 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 basic research that then eventually becomes research that, you know, for instance, pharmaceuticals can make into products that they can make money off of. There's always a, a, a too little investment societally in things that you can't monetize right away. Mm -hmm. So if it's I very hard to great, invest in things that you can't monetize right away. Yes. If I make an innovation that then in 20 years, say, will help us generate this enormously beneficial breakthrough. Unfortunately, I won't get any money because my patent has run out. That's mm -hmm. why most companies will not be investing in these long-term uh, 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 development. What happens is that you then have a darth of investment into uh, these terms, these sorts of long-term uh, uh, innovations, unless you have the public invest in them. And I'll get back to how we okay. do that smartly. Okay. But we do that in medical research. For many reasons, you know, people recognize this is part of the place where we need to you know, produce lots of professors, lots of medical Nobel laureates, and then you know, eventually the pharmaceuticals will take over and actually make products out of this. That's a great setup. We don't do this in energy. For a variety of reasons, mm. it is one of the places where we spend very, very little money. 
partly because it doesn't feel like you're solving global warming because you're not solving it right now. You're only solving it in you know 20 or 40 years. That feels like you didn't really care. But the reality is this is the only way that we're going to get these sorts of long term breakthroughs. Bjorn makes a valid point here, but he fails to acknowledge the political realities that shape policy decisions in most countries. Government spending requires parliamentary approval and changes in political leadership usually leads to shifts in priorities and policies. This creates fluctuations in policies based on the results of electoral cycles and changes in public priorities, which disrupt long term planning and investments in renewable energy infrastructure. Additionally, the lack of bipartisan consensus on climate change and energy policy further complicates efforts to maintain continuity and consistency in government support for investment in renewables. There's also a lack of infrastructure for technologies built on renewable energy in addition to the fact that scaling their output to meet the market's demands is a highly challenging task. Take for example Tesla's electric semi-trucks. These semis will run 500 miles at a full charge, but it can't be recharged using the existing superchargers. Instead, the Tesla Mega Charger is required, which is currently only available in California and Nevada. These charging stations draw power from the national grid, which according to US Energy Information Administration, generated 60% of its power from fossil fuels in 2023. One reason why politicians often screw this up is because they are not willing to invest in these long-term uh, investments. They'll say, we want a, you know, a Silicon Valley in Canada in three years. Um, yeah. That makes sense if you need to get reelected in four, uh, but you can't do that. And, and so you shouldn't be trying to do this in a very short term way. Another way is that you end up giving this away to companies uh, and companies, of course, are just going to spend it on the product that they were going to do next year anyway. Uh, but hey, thanks for the money. So the, the point here is you need to do this carefully in a way that will generate long term uh, innovation. This is not easy. You are going to waste a lot of money. But we know that governments around the world has done this in a variety of different ways. Uh, we know, for instance, the, you know, the Internet, the, uh, uh, the transistor, uh, the uh, 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 fracking in the U.S. There's a number of places where you have been successful. And all we have to do is to spend lots of money. And, and I'd love to talk more about it, specifically how we should set this up, how we should evaluate, and we should be careful about it. But fundamentally, we should do this in a way that we say we want to generate a lot of knowledge that we believe in the long run can deliver benefits that will actually help companies produce energy that will be viable. But we are not going to try and do this for the next three or five years. So we've got to stop that panic mode and start this long term thinking. We do have realistic uh, uh, knowledge about both that we're investing very little compared to typically almost all other areas and that more investment here would make it more plausible that we would faster get cheaper green energy. I think that instead of waiting for us to discover the magical formula to solve climate change, it's better to rely on the single effective solution out there that can cover our energy needs and is reliable. I'm talking about nuclear power. It's clear by now that relying solely on renewables may not be sufficient to meet the world's growing energy demands while achieving net zero emissions. Nuclear power plants can provide large scale base load electricity generation, supplying constant power around the clock, regardless of weather conditions or time of day. This reliability is particularly crucial for meeting the energy needs of modern societies while reducing reliance on carbon intensive fuels, advanced reactor design also incorporate enhanced safety features and passive cooling systems, minimizing the risk of accidents and ensuring safe operation. Additionally, advancing fuel cycles such as reprocessing and fast reactors can reduce the volume and longevity of nuclear waste, eliminating a massive burden. It is essential to understand that quick and sudden transition to renewables is not a feasible solution to climate change and the need for taking economic considerations into policy making is becoming increasingly important as our economies are already suffering due to the left pushing to its limits because of their risky spending spree. We should instead focus on innovating, building additional infrastructure and a more sustainable fiscal policy that doesn't burden the population with additional direct or indirect taxing.